Hi, I'm Philip. Welcome to RPM Amore, uh, and welcome to our very first video interview. I'm here with Julio and Jesse Ortiz. Okay. Um, they're sitting in the subject car that we're discussing today. Um, before we get into talking about the car itself, um, do you guys want to share a little bit about yourselves, maybe where you live, because um, people don't know yet? Do you want to share maybe what you do for a living? Just a quick introduction. I can go first. So, yeah. hi everyone. My name is Willie Ortiz. I'm a, a proud owner of uh, R33 Skyline GTR. Uh, I actually uh, I work for uh, the medical field. Uh, that's my full time job. I, right. uh, I supervise a team of 14 uh, um, site specialists. We support a uh, EHR um, system at a, a major medical group. Wow. Um, and we're um, you know we're we're very excited to be here with you, Philip. Uh, thank yeah, you for thank having you. us, Jesse. How's it going, everybody? My name is Jesse Ortiz. Uh, I'm a Julio son. I'm uh, 19, and I'm currently a student in college uh, studying uh, music and music education. And um, I'm definitely one of the bigger GTR enthusiasts out there. Uh, he got me into these cars before. Well, when I was born, he was into these cars before I was even born. Oh wow! And, it was kind of like a like a father son development as far as uh, finding and deepening the love for these uh, forbidden fruit you can call them. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, especially in the U.S. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yeah, and we reside in the Los Angeles, California area. Yeah, yeah. So you guys are in L.A. Um, and you have a fully federally legal Nissan Skyline GTR, correct? That is correct. This is yeah. a fully federally legal 1995 uh, R33 Series 1 Skyline GTR. It wow. was manufactured in February of 1995, and it became import legal in February of 2020 um, by the federal 25-year import ban. Yeah. And um, it was federally imported in March of 2020, and we have owned it ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. I know you guys um, in the U.S. have had to be really patient with the Skylines. I'm in Canada, so we're a little more fortunate. We got the 15-year rule. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I we've already got, you know, some R34s cruising around. I've yet to see a GTR, but some GTTs and GTS and that kind of thing and Stagias and all those. Um, yeah, so, I mean, you kind of answered what was probably going to be my first question, which is, what led you to this car? Like you shared that Julio, you've been into them since before um, Jesse was born. So that's over 19 years ago. And that, I would say that sounds to me like before the world was pretty much introduced to the skyline. Am I right? Like, I feel like Too Fast, Too Furious was kind of like the big, that was the R34. I guess there was an R33 in the first movie. So where did your interest first come from? Was it from the movies or did you learn about the car somewhere else? Well, growing up, I grew up in a, in a little town south of Los Angeles, which is a big uh, Japanese American community. Uh, it's called, uh, the city's called Gardena, California. Mm -hmm. And there's a huge Japanese influence there. So I grew up with a lot of uh, Japanese friends and, um, you know, Honda was, was big in yeah. my community. Uh, so was Toyota and Nissan. Yeah. And the yeah. Nissan headquarters was like literally right down the street in, uh, in Torrance. I believe Honda and Toyota, are, no, not Toyota, but Honda's still down there in Torrance. Right. Uh, Toyota moved out to Texas, I believe. But, um, you know, growing up, there was a heavy, heavy Japanese influence, JDM influence. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, being in high school, I saw these cars, you know, not, yeah. not these particular cars, but, um, you know, uh, Hondas and Toyotas and everything. Yeah. I mean, I always wanted one. And unfortunately, growing up uh, the way that I did and, you know, my parents, uh, working as hard as they could, I could never afford anything like that. They could never afford anything like that. Uh, and I always made it my dream uh, that when I became successful, that, you know, when I did have a career, uh, mm -hmm. that I would buy one of these cars. And of course, um, you know, you mentioned Fast and the Furious, you know, Big mm -hmm. Bird was was, yeah. a, was a big influence as well. Yeah. Um, but I think Gran Turismo was probably the biggest influence. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's the other big one. And most people who know Skylines or have known them from, you know, before Instagram days and all that kind of thing, from the early days of when they were introduced to North Americans was either Gran Turismo or Fast and the Furious. Yeah. Yeah, so a bit of both for you, probably. 
Yeah, and it was funny because the ironic part is that Motor X was based out of Gardena, and I, I right. had no clue. No clue, yeah. Philip. I had no idea whatsoever. It was right in your backyard, and you didn't even know what was going on. That's hilarious. That. <laughs> Until, <laughs> you know, everything came about, and yeah. uh, then I was like, wow, they were, like, literally right in my backyard. I had no idea, but yeah, uh, if, if you go down to Gardena now, I mean, it's still heavily Japanese influence. Uh, most mm-hmm. of the Japanese Americans move towards the Torrance, California area, but uh, you, you definitely see a JDM uh, influence there. And, um, you know, and, and when I go back to my hometown, it just feels great to be there because of, you know, the Japanese, some of the Japanese folks that are still there and some of my friends. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious too. You said when you were young, you always dreamed of owning one of these cars. When you say that, do you refer to just like a really cool JDM car or specifically Skyline? Uh, well, when I was in high school, um, well, there was a lot of cars, but the one that always grabbed my attention was the NSX. I mean, uh, yeah. The yeah. Sup- the Supra. Yeah. You know, those were the ones that I wanted. Um, and even, believe it or not, I even wanted a Maxima. <laughs> yeah. You know, growing up in that area, we also had the the lowrider culture. You know, myself mm-hmm. being of Mexican American descent, um, mm-hmm. there was also the lowrider influence. People would um, get these Maximas and you know the Nissan uh, trucks or the Datsun trucks, the mini trucks. They would paint them, you know, uh, cherry apple or you know a beautiful color. They would they would lower them. They would add sounds, a, a booming mm-hmm. sound system. So that was the 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 Latino, the Mexican, and the Japanese culture clashing. Mm-hmm. And and I thought it was beautiful because I didn't know that in Japan they really they really love the lowrider lot, you know, the Mex the Chicano culture out there. Yeah, I think it's amazing, you know. So um i had the best of both both worlds i had the low rider culture and the jdm culture in my in my backyard oh that's really cool that's awesome man yeah and i love when you see people from both cultures you know coming together and just appreciating what the others have done because you know well i guess more than anything i'm probably a jdm guy but i appreciate cars bikes trucks from you know all different genres if you want to call them that um because the amount of workmanship that goes into, say, hot rotting and the creativity, you know, the individual um, customization and that kind of thing. Or even if somebody just keeps a bone stock classic, you know, original for years, just it takes a lot to maintain a vehicle at that standard, especially if you're driving it. Well, even if you're not, if it, it'll, it'll sit there and rot if you don't take care of it. So I can really appreciate, um, you know, people from all different realms. Um, so, Jesse, um, you yes. were explaining a little bit earlier. Um, let's just get into, you know, what your involvement is. And man, could you ask for a cooler dad, Julio? I know, man. Skyline Every GTR day. owner, you're 19. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Um, you know, seriously enough, we actually went to a meet and uh, they thought I, like he was my older brother. They couldn't believe that he was like my dad. When because... you guys first popped on, I thought the same thing. <laughs> Oh, really? thank you for I thought life. you guys were brothers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's really, really, um, really a blessing every day that I'm grateful for because, um, you know, at a young age, um, I was very, like, heavily exposed to these kind of cars. And that's what kind of built the love for the culture of, of JDM culture that I, I am very, very deeply profound of to this very day and mm-hmm. probably will be for the rest of my life. But uh, you know, my dad, he had Gran Turismo. He said, yo, like when I, when I was like three or four years old, he, I remember him showing me the Fast and the Furious, the mm-hmm. first car, the big yellow R33 that yeah. popped on the screen. That caught my eye. And I'm yeah. like, you know, that's like one of the coolest cars I've ever seen. And then when I grew older, when, you know, when you can say when the dreams started becoming more attainable, that's when the research really started to kick in for me and starting to find out the motorsports history the racing the heritage Mm -hmm. behind nismo nissan calsonic you name it yeah and it was really when i went up and asked him i said hey you like these cars don't you and he was like yeah he he," and we went from there well that's Uh, so cool that you guys kind of found it independently you know and then came together and went, oh, we have this common interest. Because, you know, hearing it right off the bat, I would have assumed, Julio, you'd introduce Jesse to this. But that's kind of cool that you found it on your own path. Mm-hmm. It was like so a then, mixture of both. A mixture of both, yeah. 
So then was it kind of like a joint thing that you guys came together and went, you know what, let's do it. Let's live the dream. Let's get ourselves a skyline. Was that 100% what happened? Because um, we've always owned Japanese cars. Like, Mm -hmm. like his first car was a Honda, I do believe. And then he had an Accord and Accord. And then he learned to drive on a Datsun 510 out in in Gardena. That's how he learned to drive manual transmission. And ever since then, he would buy Honda like as like a family car, like a a Honda Accord, and then an Acura TSX. Acura TSX, Mm -hmm. Acura TL, TLX. Yeah. I always had Acura. I've always been, I was a Honda guy. Yeah. Um, But, you know, uh, and and right before this car, Philip, I had a 2018 WRX. Oh, Uh, cool. Yeah. And, uh, and we would take it to, you know, the mountain roads out here. Yeah. Um, you probably heard of some of these GMR, which is Glendora Mountain Road, mm-hmm. one of the most dangerous roads out here in L.A. Mm-hmm. Um, they just had, unfortunately, they just had a fatality. Like about a week ago. A week ago, uh, a Miata drove off the side there. And uh, unfortunately, the guy didn't make it. But it's, it's a very dangerous road. And, yeah. you know, we, we took the, 28, the 2018 up there and we did some night um uh, cru- uh not cruising but we took the toge we call it toge right yeah. the japanese word for mountain we, we did the toge at around midnight mm-hmm. and it gave me this adrenaline rush like mm-hmm. wow i uh i need to get something better yeah I need to get something <laughs> so you're uh, like a, yeah i love the all-wheel goal. drive i love the turbo but i want to just turn it up a notch <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the initial dream like the initial dream mm-hmm. of like the dream skyline that he's always wanted was always like not just the 33 but the 34 because of too mm-hmm. fast too furious and he knew about the twin turbo all-wheel drive system and he knew that the subaru wrx was basically in its shadow yeah of, as far as being a japanese twin turbo or all-wheel drive and so when we realized that these cars are starting to become legal and also the moment we realized that we're too tall to fit in an R32 <laughs> is when we started realizing that the that skylines are a really, really great, not just investment, but really an amazing driving experience for everybody, not just the driver, but the passengers as well, because this is the roomiest skyline out of the three, out of right. the three R chassis skylines. This has the most room out of any of them. The knees, your knees don't hit your steering wheel because we're both six feet tall your knees yeah. don't hit your steering wheel your seats are comfortable and you have leg room up here and then in the back the rear seats it sits four comfortably total four yeah. in car absolutely comfortable when we went to the uh, japanese classic car show here in southern california which is the biggest jdm car show in i believe north america outside of japan um we comfortably fit four people in here oh, so wow. we yeah, it was it was awesome. Yeah. We uh, we rolled in with four people, and so it's not uh, just a two plus two. You know, it's you know a, an actual four seater. Yeah, because we wanted well, well, well not just that. Because when we when we uh, sold the WRX, we wanted something that could properly replace it. Because you know the mm-hmm. WRX it was a four door, comfortably seated. I think five, because yeah. it has like a middle seat. But this one doesn't have a middle seat just because mm-hmm. the transmission and the drive shaft yeah. are in the way. So we were wondering like what could be as practical seating wise as the wrx but better you you guys are the first i've ever heard talk about practical reasons for getting a skyline (laughs) (laughs) it's it's funny to hear the flip side of things because within jdm culture and fan base the r33 is probably the least loved out of the three and to me it's always been a little bit confusing i actually really love the look of the r33 Um, but you know, it's hated on, I guess, because of weight and being fat looking people say, or whatever looking, I don't get it personally, but you know, it's a matter of taste, right? But for you guys with the experience of owning and driving, sitting in one, you're talking about how it's nice that it's spacious and it's more livable and possibly more functional as a daily, um, just to live with than, Mm -hmm. than, um, the other generation. So that's kind of cool. You see, the thing is, though, it's like when they talk about the weight, a lot of people fail to realize that the R34 is actually 100 pounds heavier than the R33. Yeah, I know. I get that, too. It's like, yeah, it's heavier than the R32, but the R34 is so loved and put up on this pedestal and it's even heavier still. So, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. And people forget that the R33 and I know you know this, but a lot of people forget that. It had the fastest time on the Merber ring mm. uh, from the three, you know, the 32 and the 34 and the 33. This car had the fastest time. Mm. Uh, 
And the other thing that I get, Philip, when we go to these meets is when people that were hating on the R33 see it in person, mm-hmm. they actually see it and they see, oh, wait, wait a minute. It's not as big as it looks on, yeah. you know, on social media. It's not that big. Oh, my God. I, I had a misperception. I always yeah. thought that it was a bigger car. You know what? It's actually a nice car. Yeah. And we get a lot of that, you know. So we've been turning a lot of the, the haters into actual uh, lovers of the R33. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's just that, but like the 33 hasn't become legal until two years ago because mm-hmm. they were first came out in 95, which is this one. And yeah. the last of the R33s become legal next year, which are the 98s. Mm-hmm. And before that, nobody had seen it. And then, of course, because of the 2020 and 2021 COVID shutdowns, nobody had had the chance to see these cars in public that who, who didn't own them, of course. And so when we started taking these out on the road, people would look at it and they're like is that a 32 is that a 34 no no it was a car where they saw the badge they saw the skyline badge and Mm -hmm. they knew it wasn't a 32 or a 34 so they had to narrow it down to one if they didn't know what this was so that's what i love about this car is that people realizing that the car is not as bad as it quote unquote seems you know you know i love i love any sort of vehicle that makes people ask questions you know like (laughs) it piques their interest enough to be like i like that but I'm not sure what I'm looking at. I want to know more. <laughs> you know, those are the really interesting cars. Whereas, you know, there's lots of beautiful Corvettes and Challengers and whatever. You see them all the time, right? They're awesome yeah, cars, great bang for the buck, performance for money kind of thing, Mustangs, whatever. But you see it and you know what it is. You know mm-hmm. what you're getting. It's cool, but loads of people have got, got them. But something that makes you just wonder a little bit, you know, that those are the really interesting cars for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys definitely got one there. So I know the, that we turned a lot of oh sorry Philip I know that we turned a okay. lot of heads definitely especially when we took it to um, Azusa Canyon which is where they filmed the final scene of uh, 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 Tokyo Drift uh, yeah. remember that final scene when uh, he was racing with the uh, RB26 yeah Mustang uh, uh, Mustang and yeah. and the uh, the what was it 370Z 370Z it was 350 so we we took it there and people were just people were literally breaking their necks because they couldn't believe that they were seeing an R33 yeah. up in Azusa, you know, the Azusa um, uh, uh, mountain road or the, the mm-hmm. toge, if you will. And when we just stepped on it and I wasn't holding back, I took mm-hmm. that road like there was no tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, people, I'm telling you, people couldn't believe it. They're, they were like yeah. losing their, you know what, because yeah. uh, they didn't think that the R33 could handle something like that. Yeah, you know, because yeah. it's they always thought, oh, you're gonna take it to the track, because that's what the first thing people would say. Hey, are you taking it to the track? And we're like, no, no, we're taking it to the mountains. They're like, yeah. what? So it's really nimble to drive, then, is what you're saying. Oh, absolutely. This yeah. car compared to a 2018 Subaru WRX, it feels like you're driving like a go kart compared to a full size car. That's how wow. maneuverable this car is, that's considering crazy. that the curb weight is actually significantly less than a 2018 Subaru WRX. And yeah. of course, not just that, but their overall wheelbase is shorter, even though they said the R33 has the longest wheelbase. And yeah. it's just the best handling out of the R, out of the R chassis GTR is because of the longer wheelbase. Yeah. yeah. There you go. All the haters out there. Listen, <laughs> it's unjustified. I would love to see an R34 go up there. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about the car. Like what? how stock is it i know you got some beautiful raised wheels on there beyond that i don't know what's going on oh well it used to be stock (laughs) (laughs) um so basically uh the car had around 135,000 kilometers when we got it so it was uh pretty driven driven pretty hard in japan it was uh graded as uh, a b in the auction so it wasn't like a but it was like good, good condition, you know, good enough to buy. And the car was uh, market value. We bought it for 48,000 in 2021 and two, oh, no, sorry, 2020. So this was when they became legal, like when they first became legal. Yeah. And so ever since then, base model R33 GTRs have risen up to about 80, 70 to 80 thousand dollars. I mean, all the JDMs are going crazy for sure mm-hmm. and the the halo models like skylines and supers and everything are right up at the top and it's just absolutely nuts so yeah you oh, yeah. guys are really fortunate you got in when you did yeah we didn't want to make the same mistake with the 32 because in 2016 
like I said before, we realized that we couldn't fit in an R32. Mm-hmm. They became legal in 2016, the first 1989 uh, R32s that are amazing cars. And um, they were going for sale for about twenty three dollars to $24,000 for a very, very nice example. Yeah, yeah. And so we and that's were like, attainable. That's attainable for the average person. Oh, yeah. That yeah. was definitely attainable. It was an attainable car. They made the most... Uh, r32s out of the three r chassis gtr Mm -hmm. yeah i actually went to high school with a guy who's a grade behind me and he had an r32 gtr in high school oh yeah he didn't have any special job or anything but that was you know at that point it was it was an attainable car which is crazy to think Mm -hmm. and now like good r32s are close to 60 70 thousand dollars now just Mm -hmm. because it's an r32 you know yeah it's the skyline tax but anyway, I digress. That's okay. <laughs> the, um, right. the car is um, definitely modified because at around a um, hundred and I want to say a hundred and thirty. Like, let me see how many kilometers it has because I, I remember it in miles. So it's at one hundred and thirty nine thousand kilometers right now, but that's roughly eighty four, eighty five thousand miles. But at around eighty four thousand miles, uh, we started experiencing some knock in the engine. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And so that's when we realized that this motor was going out because we saw that the car had gone through numerous auction houses in Japan before we actually pulled the trigger. It went through six different auction houses, all with different modifications on it and different body tar- body parts. Oh, so, really? Uh, yeah, there's, it, it, was, it went through a lot of different phases and it was pretty cool to see each and every one of them because mm-hmm. we saw that with every one, things were taken out, things were added, things were kept, but it was driven. It was yeah. driven. That's yeah. the thing that I liked about this car is because it wasn't like a collectible piece. It wasn't like a museum piece that you should never touch or drive and you yeah. feel guilty about, but rather a car that when we bought it, we didn't feel guilty about driving it. We didn't yeah. feel guilty about taking it to the canyons. Nail on the head, man. You know, uh, everybody dreams of that absolutely pristine bone stock model or whatever that's fetching over a hundred grand, but do you really want that? you know no, no. no it's gonna sit in your garage and you're gonna take it out two times a year and be sweating bullets every time you do exactly. you want something you could actually drive and have fun with for what it was intended for yeah exactly yeah um, so what have you done to it do you rebuild the engine then or you swap so, so what did you do? the car was uh, the car did go through an engine rebuild as late or as early as um this april this april the engine rebuild finished Hmm. And it, of course, it was a stock twin turbo RB26 inline six. Mm-hmm. And now, right now, um, we ended up upgrading the pistons. The block was machined and polished, and mm-hmm. we upgraded the pistons to HKS VCAM pistons mm-hmm. in preparation for the upgrade to VCAM someday. But uh, it's got HKS VCAM pistons. Nice. It has a new crankshaft, a new OEM crankshaft, of course, because, you know, the OEM ones are pretty good for, you know, the power output that we're putting out. But yeah, we have Garrett 2860 RS turbos. Uh, we are currently running a fully restored uh, OEM intake assembly that was done by our amazing mm. friend, Remade in USA, who specializes in restoring the intake side of this car to better than factory, better than OEM. You could say the eye candy of the car yeah. that a lot of people love because the thing with these cars is that they come stock uh, R33s with a black coated intake manifold. Mm-hmm. And we had that uh, initially, but it was chipped. It was faded. It was disgusting. Mm-hmm. You know, you can tell it was aged. Yeah. And um, we had rust on the strut towers and yeah. it was it was nasty. It was, ugly. It was a 25 year old car. Yeah, yeah. It was a, from yeah, Japan, exactly not California. Expect. Mm -hmm. and you can tell the rust that was like one thing and so the shop that actually rebuilt the motor they actually did a full engine bay restoration including um you know repainting all the bad parts all the bad paint and restoring and re-welding the strut top so now it has better you know structure and rigidity in the strut top so that it doesn't like waste away any other day do you want to give a shout out to the shop who did the build yeah, uh, we love them. They are they are great friends. We love Original Auto Van Nuys. They are the greatest. They specialize in Skyline GTRs, performance and restoration. Awesome. They have some of the craziest builds you ever see. Uh, one of their highlights builds is of course a 1, 000, 11, 000, 1100 horsepower R34 GTR. All right. Mm-hmm. And that's one of that's one of the big ones right there. 